Welcome to Civil Discourse, a podcast where participants are free to share their ideas, empathize with other perspectives, and who intend to advance to a better solution to fix a societal ill. We will focus on topics that are particularly complicated. In a time where information is from sources more opinionated than ever, our mission is to find solutions and goals to accelerate the nation's progress with cultural impunity. I'm your host, Todd Furness. Welcome to today's episode of Civil Discourse hosted by Todd Furness. I'm Todd Furness, your host, and I'm really excited to have the fantastic Christine Handy with us today. She is going to talk about her story. And before I do that, I always like to remind people to please like, share, and subscribe Uh, because we need your support for the content. And we're trying to tackle particularly complicated issues. And there's not really a big place, a good place for that on the web or on podcasts or on public uh, media. So uh, please uh, lend us your support in that way. Christine, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited about this conversation. It's going to be so much fun for me anyway. I hope it's fun for you, but uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So you've got a really, really uh, interesting background. And I want to kind of dive into that just for a little bit. Um, you started as a, uh, you got kind of recruited as a model early early in the going. Yeah. Tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, so I started modeling when I was 11 years old. So definitely a child. And my parents weren't really that supportive of it. They didn't want really me to start in that career, but I pushed through, (laughs) which is probably why I'm still here. If you uh, look at my story and all the adversity and um, I've been a model for actually 40 years, I'm 51 now and I'm still modeling. I'm actually walking in New York fashion week in February. So it's been a long, it's been a long career. I've actually taken a step back a couple of times, you know, when I was going through chemotherapy, I obviously wasn't working, but I'm back in. Wow. Are you excited about that? Are you excited to be back in the, in the game? Yeah, I've been back for about three or four years. I have a great agency. I, you know, it's it's something like we get super comfortable in what we do, right? And so it was kind of like a missing limb when I wasn't modeling. There was space that was not that was empty in my life. And so it's good to be back. So we're gonna do a little bit of a chronological walk because I think that's helpful for people to understand a little bit about your story and who you are and why all the things that you're doing are in essence integrated into a single purpose. That's my view, not not your state of view, but I think that's fair to say. Um, so you you go off and you're a model and you're on all the publications and everybody's loving you and Tell us about before you get uh, before you're at the height of your modeling career, school and how did you complete school and what does that mean? Yeah, so in high school, I missed a lot of school, um, but I, I was a very good student, so it didn't really affect me. And then I went to SMU. I actually picked SMU. I grew up in St. Louis and then I moved to Dallas because I wanted a bigger market, modeling market, I had bigger agencies, bigger opportunities. JC Penny was headquartered there. I did a lot of work for them and Dillard's and, and clients like that. But I also wanted an education and I wasn't sure that I was going to continue to model after SMU or college. And so I picked SMU as a bigger market and that's how I ended up in Dallas. And I stayed there for a long time. (laughs) And you got a chance to travel internationally and worldwide and uh, made all the top publications. and, And then what happened? So I got married and had two children, which is the best thing I've ever done in my life. And then I started to get sick about age of 35. And I'll never forget. I had a, I had emergency colon resection and I had, I woke up from that surgery and I had a port in my neck and I, other than the unbearable pain, I was having, I was having blood transfusions and I couldn't figure out what had happened within the surgery. Uh, unfortunately, the doctor had nicked a vein in one of my bones in my pelvis, and I almost bled to death on the table. And ironically enough, he knew I was modeling at the time because I'd showed him some of my publications that I was in. And I said, are we sure we're doing this orthoscopically? And he said, of course, yes, this is an ortho- orthoscopic surgery. And so when I woke up, I felt down in my, in the recovery room, I felt down in my stomach and I had staples hundreds of staples all across my abdomen. And so he had ultimately opened me up from hip to hip. And obviously the first thing I, I didn't think about my modeling career first, right? That wasn't my first thought. My first thought was why do I have a port in my neck and what is a port and how do I get out of this astronomical pain? 
But after the dust settled, I thought, what am I going to do? I mean, I was a staple for JC Penney. I was in there. I was in the newspaper. Remember the newspaper? I was in the newspaper every Sunday. I was their lingerie. I did their lingerie, did their bathing suits. That was my bread and butter. And, and so that was, that was, that was unfortunate for me. Wow. And so walk us through the process. You're in the hospital and how long are you in? Tell us about the concerns. Cause I think you're at the time, well, describe your, your economic situation. Were you worried about paying the bills or are you insured or how, how did all that stuff work? No, fortunately I was not worried about the bills that obviously is a big difference between most people's lives, but I, um, it was a comfort zone for me, but also forget the modeling. I had just lost 28 inches of my colon. I had a port in my neck. I was on my second blood transfusion. I was in the hospital by myself, not because it was COVID time where you weren't allowed in the hospital, but I had young kids. And so my husband at the time was home helping with the children as I'm, you know, stay at home mom slash model, part-time model. And so I, it, it took me a long time to recover from that surgery. I lost a lot of blood and that was the beginning of my health crisis. I mean, I was, I was a thriving mother, wife, model, self-proclaimed athlete. And to go from that to a continuation of health crises was obviously very life-changing. So how long were you in the hospital? And then how long did rehab take after that? So I was in the hospital that time for about 10 days. And then it took about a year for me to recover. But for a long time, the doctors couldn't figure out what was the prolonged effect of what had happened to me. And so eventually I went to the Mayo Clinic and spent about a month there and they diagnosed me with um, a fructose intolerance because the portion of the colon that they took out was the digestive part of your colon that digests sugar. So ultimately, since I was 35, I've not been able to digest sugar, which in hindsight was kind of confusing at the time. But now I figure it's a total blessing, (laughs) (laughs) not the surgery, but the being allergic to sugar. Well, I think they're, you're, you're putting a positive spin on it, I think, and I understand why, but it's still incredibly difficult. Um, so let me, let me stop there for a second. So I think that for that moment in my life, that was kind of like a faith, you know, block. Like, I think God was saying like, okay, like stop here and let's take inventory of your life. Right. And I was so dependent on what I look like and so dependent on the external value that even with that blockade, even that with that kind of nugget of change, I still didn't get it. Like it was so important for me to go to the yoga class instead of the Bible study. So I tripped over myself and I didn't stop there. So, okay, we can keep going. <laughs> well, no, no, it's, it's really interesting because I think there's a thread here and you know, in, in anticipating today's discussion, I went and looked at some, some other interviews. And I think there's an interesting thread here that kind of goes back to your early 20s, right? Which is, and you refer to it as, I thought very, very elegantly, the inside job. Well, the inside job is what I've learned over the course of time, especially in my 40s. I think that our self-value, our self-worth comes from the inside. But until I was 41 years old and diagnosed with cancer, I always thought my value was dependent on the outside, external accolades, my modeling career, my husband's attention or affection, my friends, my anything external materialism, all of that gave me a fleeting self-esteem, but that's what I thought was the value. Right. So we skipped from 35 to 41 and you got sick again, obviously. Um, Tell us a little about that. So when I was 40, I had, a, I had a, a surgery on my right arm in Dallas and I had a torn ligament on my wrist and the doctor performed the surgery. And six weeks later, the cast comes off and I, my arm kind of ballooned on a Sunday. And I thought, well, you know, I had always been taught as a daughter, as a woman that you, you respect authority, you respect, you stay in your lane. And so I wasn't really, I didn't have a lot of self-confidence back then. And so I wasn't really sure that I was up to calling the doctor on a Sunday. I thought, oh, I'll just wait till Monday. Well, I ultimately couldn't wait till Monday because I was in so much pain. Now, is this just edema building up in your, in your arm or what was, what was causing the inflation of the, of the arm? So I had had that surgery uh, six weeks prior. And so at the time I didn't know what was wrong. 
So I actually literally carried my arm like a child that whole day because there, there was so much swelling and there's so much pain. And so ultimately I, I did call the doctor and he said, I over iced it. Now I have, I have degrees. I have a degree from SMU. I'm getting a degree from Harvard right now, but I didn't go to medical school. So I believed him. Ultimately, seven months later, I saw a second opinion, second doctor, and every bone in my wrist was broken. And the reason that my arm was destroyed was because I had an infection in my arm the entire time that they dated back to the surgery. But the doctor told me that the sweat, the, the swelling and the pain was in my head. And he, he mip, manipulated me in, in a way that I believed him. And so once he bullied me and my self-esteem was completely shattered, I was diagnosed with breast cancer after my arm was fused. And so I'm up in New York City. My arm is now just fused. I have no wrist because of what this doctor has done to me. And I'm in a hotel room and I'm taking a shower and my cast is outside of the shower and I'm trying to wash my body. And I take a bar of soap and I wash my breast and I felt a lump. Within five days, I was diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer. So I'm now trying to figure out how am I going to live the rest of my life, be a mother, you know, cook, drive, all these things with a, with a fused arm. And now I have to go through chemotherapy and who knows what the outcome is going to be. I had no idea if I would survive it or not. And <laughs> holy cow. <laughs> so how quickly did you have the operation? So interestingly enough, we had to postpone chemotherapy because the grafts that had just been posted in my arm and the cadaver bones would have dissolved because of the chemotherapy. And so for 30, I was diagnosed with breast cancer on October 1st. So for 30 days, we had to postpone chemo. So they did a lumpectomy immediately just to get the cancer out. And then on October 31st, Halloween, I had my first chemotherapy treatment. Uh, yeah, that was one of 28. At 28 rounds of chemo. Oh my gosh. So that involves a whole lot of stuff and it's very difficult. So you're in and out of the hospital and uh, you're dealing with this and you're also trying to figure out how do you care for your kids and how do you manage that? I mean, how do you stay on top of it? How do you cope with it? And who, you know, I think you referred to your inner warrior. Yeah. Um, when did you find your inner warrior and, and how did you cope with all these issues? Yeah, that was that October 2012 was my inner warrior. You know, that was a teachable moment for me because for so long I had not felt like I had a really a, a strong self-esteem it, because I had built it on sand, right? I had built it on materialism. I had built it on people. I had built it on what society thought of me. And when you build your life on that, it crumbles very easily. Mine crumbled. Everything about my life crumbled. And then I had an opportunity as I was going through chemotherapy to do a lot of introspection. And as I was going through that process, a lot of people showed up for me in my life. Thank goodness, because it was them showing up for me that was rebuilding my self-esteem. And my friends and my family would say to me, you know, there's going to be purpose in this pain and people are watching you. And not, it wasn't just my children that were watching, but the community is what was watching and they were watching to see how I was going to react. Right. And so it didn't, my, who I was didn't just shift at that moment, right? I, I had a low self-esteem and ultimately started to be built up by my friendships. But there were moments in that journey where I, I just wasn't sure what the outcome was, but I still decided that I was going to show bravery. And I still decided that I was going to show grit and grace because my children were watching. And so I started to lose the fear of the outcome. I started to lose the worry of the outcome. I didn't know whether I was going to survive or not, but that wasn't the, the goal. The goal was to show up for myself every day. The goal was to show bravery for my children and to teach them what life looks like as a warrior. So I, I'm, I'm pausing. I mean, my, uh, my own mind, it, I, I'm sort of stuck by this. You know, here you are, this breathtakingly beautiful woman. I say that all due respect, I'm not, uh, but I, I just... And you have such presence and such awareness to capture your own moment, your own, your own dynamics in a way that you can not only rebuild your foundation, but also you know, turn it to good use, right? I mean, right. for yourself and then for, for your family members and, and friends in the community at large, it's a stunning amount of awareness, not only of the condition you're in, right. but also the platform 
you may not have even realized you had, right? Oh, I had no idea at the time. And I didn't know that I would ever use it. I, I decided to write my book several years after this journey. But I realized that because I had gone from being so dependent on the external, so dependent on society and really empty inside that never filled me up. It was so fleeting. Listen, there is no U-Haul behind the hearse. We cannot take it with us. But I was like clinging to those things. And then I had a fused arm where I couldn't even carry those expensive bags that I had bought. And I thought, how ironic is this? And how can I use this to help other people so that they don't stay stuck and dependent on that, right? It took me 41 years to figure it out and a lot of illness and a lot of trauma. And so when I eventually wrote my book, I wanted to write it in a way that was very vulnerable and honest about where I had come from to who I was now. And it's, it's quite, you know, the, the parallels are, there's no parallels in it. It's the disparity is great, but it's an interesting novel. It's a fictional depiction of my life, but it, it's very vulnerable and people like it because it's very vulnerable. So they don't feel so alone. Right. And I think that's the greatest gift about storytelling. So once my book was published, I had a bigger platform and I thought I should use this, not for my own self-glory at all. It wasn't about Christine Handy. It was about, I'm going to use the pain. It, it just kept propelling me. And that wasn't the end of my pain. I've had other suffering since then, but every single time I've tried to use that as a propeller to help other people. And so it's just a choice. Everything is about our reaction. And so I reacted in a way that was serving other people instead of being so self-involved. So when I was uh, looking at the book, I, I kind of said, hey, wait a minute, is Christine Willow? Oh, yeah, no, definitely. Um, it's actually being made into a film. It is a fictional depiction of my life. And Willow has always been a nickname of mine. And so, yeah, no, Willow is definitely me. <laughs> so, in case people are wondering, Willow is the lead character in the book. And the book is called uh, Walk Beside Me. And uh, we'll put a link to the at the bottom so people can access it. Um, but this has led to a whole series of other kind of alternative things that you're working on. So you're involved with eBeauty and, and a few other things. So I want to kind of take an opportunity to, to mention those as well. But I, I think that your story is so gripping and it, it happens to be, you know, timely in that this is breast cancer awareness month. Mm -hmm. uh, and so obviously it's a, it's a central issue and a central theme for the, for the month. Obviously we're, I'm in Dallas and, and uh, we have the morning Conley Brinker foundation here and which is very focused on that. Uh, but talk about e-beauty and how you got into that. Yeah. So right now I, my life is more about serving and, however that translates into my day-to-day -day walk. And so after this journey, after this self-inflection and all these self-discoveries, I decided that it was important for me to be on a couple boards. And so uh, eBeauty is a wig exchange program and I'm on the board of directors there. And basically we redistribute wigs that women have used during treatment. Wigs are very expensive and there's hundreds of thousands of women that cannot afford them. So we have so far redistributed about 57,000 wigs to women who need them. We've partnered with L'Oreal, um, who gives us grant money. Our biggest cost is shipping. It's about $20 a wig. And we've partnered with Paul Mitchell Salons who wash and refurbish the wigs. And then we ship them out from there. And so it's a great way um, for me to give back and, and to help other people going through the same journey. I am also on another board called um, People of Purpose, which is completely separate than breast cancer. I actually speak in the prisons, in some of the prisons in Florida. Ironically enough, not any of the women's prisons. <laughs> I thought when they first hired me to speak in prisons, <laughs> I would be speaking in women's prisons. But no, I only speak in men's prisons for now. I I'm sure you're a very big draw in the men's prison. <laughs> Well, I have a lot of stories about that. Um, but so in speaking in these prisons, uh, people are allowed to email you if you if you give them access to an email. And so one of the prisoners kept in touch with me. And, and when he was released from prison, he reached out to me on social media about four years ago. And he said, hey, can you meet for coffee? I have a great idea. And I said, sure. Um, which is another funny story, because some of my friends were like, you're not going to go meet that <laughs> prisoner for coffee. He was in jail for murder. And I said, no, I definitely am. 
<laughs> and so I met with him. And hold on, hold on, hold on, stop, stop. Hold on, <laughs> he was in jail for murder? For 32 years. He was in jail for 32 years. And he said, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm going to go have coffee with him by myself. Well, I mean, I met him at the end of his 32 years where he was in a rehabilitation prison. And so, and we had emailed, he had emailed me uh, for a There's while. There's no inner now. warrior about you. There's just warrior. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm trying to justify it. There's, there's, I don't need to justify anything. The guy is a human being, and I, have, I don't care. It's all good. I'm, 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 no, 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 I'm applauding. I'm just, I'm no, applauding no, no, no. the courage. But, but so many people, they say that to me, and I'm like, well, you know, I, I just, I, you know what? When you're faced with such trials and and trauma, you just live every day. I don't care what it is, you just live. You and so, scoff at death. I, I do scoff at death. No, you have no idea. I, yeah, we, we, we can talk all day about that. Um, anyway, so he and I started this organization called People of Purpose, and it's basically changing the rate of recidivism in Palm Beach County. So we're not giving, we're, an analogy is we're not trying to feed people that get out of prison. We're trying to teach them how to fish, right? And so we offer, we pick them up when they, well, our organization picks them up when they get out of prison. We go and take them shopping to get they don't want handouts. They want new clothes. So we get them, take them some, get them some new clothes. And then we put them into some transitional housing. And then we try to give them skills. And so we've partnered with construction companies and we've partnered with um, some trucking companies to teach them how to, you know, work an RV and all these other things. And so it's actually working. We are changing the rate of recidivism in Palm Beach County. So those are the two boards I sit on. That's fantastic. I mean, genuinely fantastic. I mean, those are critical uh, things to do. And, and I think, you know, at some point you've got to say the individual who has gone in and served time has paid his debt to society and they need to be reintegrated back into society. And I think as a society, we're pretty good at, pe- at putting people into jail. And I think we're pretty bad at taking people out of jail. Without question. Yeah. You so, nailed it. Yeah. So, People with Purpose, E-Beauty, you wrote a book, you're making it into a movie, you're getting a degree at Harvard. Oh, well, let's hit the pause button on that. Um, what degree are you getting in Harvard? I'm getting a master's. Oh, hold on, stop. Don't, don't even tell me. Um, neuroscience, <laughs> astrophysics, next. quantitative that's math. That's next. I, ironically, the reason I went back to school was because I had such a terrible chemo brain. I had a lot of chemotherapy and it really does change your brain. For me, it was significant. Like I would drive down the road and not remember if there weren't any other cars driving, I would not remember what side of the street to to drive on literally. And I would pull off to the side of the road and wait to see another car that literally happened to me. And I knew then that I couldn't just do crossword puzzles that I really needed to challenge my brain. And so I went back to school. I I go to Harvard. And that's the other reason why I picked Harvard was because my self-esteem was now rooted in faith. It was rooted in a, in a belief that I was unstoppable. And I had so much value in what I was doing with my life that I was like, I'm just going to apply to Harvard. And if they say, no, it's okay. I'm not afraid of a no. I'm not afraid of a rejection, but they said, yes. And so I've been there for about a year and a half. I'm getting my master's in creative writing and literature. And the, my language skills have completely changed. My chemo brain has completely gone away. And so it's, it's quite literally changed my life. So you look at your brain as a muscle that you have to train, just like you were an athlete that trained. A self-proclaimed athlete. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you become a self-proclaimed athlete without being an athlete. It didn't really well, work that way. I never really played a sport anywhere. I just love sports and I love to play sports. I play a lot of tennis. I, anyway. Self-proclaimed. Which makes you an athlete. So um, so the issue, the, one of the big issues we're facing today is a genuine crisis in, in mental health issues. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked a little about uh, your, inner, your inside game and self-worth and, yet, and also about cognitive issues, right? Your ability right. to think clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, but you've you've seemed to have overcome all these things, right? You you've been very intentional about it. Is this a case of 
your will, your willpower, your discipline, your strength of conviction overcoming things? Or is it something else? Because a lot of these things are either psychological Mm -hmm. or behavioral or uh, almost mechanical in, in terms of the cognitive issues. How have you done that? Yeah, most people that read my story or know my story often ask, how am I still standing? And that's a legitimate question. Um, I even last summer when everybody was panicked about COVID, March of 2020, April of 2020, June of 2020, I was in and out of the hospital for about four months because I had a MRSA infection in my chest, which ultimately led to the excavation of my breast implants. I was having a, a terrible time with the implants after my mastectomies. And so, but when I was in the hospital, this will just give you an example of kind of that, what you're asking about that drive or that will, or where I get that in the hospital, I was, I had already been booked for a a speech and I had already, and I had one, one of my classes at Harvard, I was doing a presentation to the whole student, well, to the master's program in the master's that I'm doing. And so that was like on a Wednesday and that was a Thursday. I checked into the hospital Tuesday night. And so I emailed my inst- professor. I call my professors instructors and they get so mad at Harvard. They're like, we're not instructors, we're professors. And so I emailed my professor and said, I am in the hospital, but I'm, I've got my stuff. I'm, I'm capable. I can do this. So I did the, I did the speech, which was the next day. And then the presentation to Harvard, I did the following day, all from a hospital gown and an IV in my arm. And if I quit, if I ever quit during my journey, I wouldn't be here. And, but I wouldn't have the tools to help other people. I wouldn't have the grit and the grace to help other people. And so me quitting is not just quitting on me. It's quitting on other people. And so that's how I think of it. And I, I just don't want to quit. I, I, don't, I definitely don't want to quit on myself because my self-esteem, I, like I said, is unshakable. Um, but I also don't quit, want to quit on other people. And that's kind of how I do it. But again, even last summer where I, now I have a concave chest. If I had decided to quit, people wouldn't have blamed me. Right. But it's our reaction to this trauma that dictates our future. I can't allow the illnesses to dictate my future. It's my reaction to the illnesses that's going to dictate my future. So what's interesting is that many people, um, are able to bifurcate their self, meaning their spirit, their inner self from their external self. And they're frequently encouraged to do that because their outer self has issues, meaning it's not attractive. It's um, doesn't fully function or there's some other issue. You've done exactly the opposite in, in a sense, right? Your outer self is, has so have been so attractive as to, as to cause you challenges that you've had to overcome by relying on your inner self. Um, I don't know. You you probably don't know this, but in the opening chapter of my book, I talk extensively about my mother and my mom and dad were involved in a really bad plane crash in 1977. My dad was killed immediately. It was the worst aviation accident in the history of Georgia. My mother suffered third degree burns on two thirds of her body. Um, And she was hospitalized at Grady Memorial over two thirds of her body was like I said, third degree burns are worse, uh, countless operations, amputations, grafts, et cetera. And fortunately, uh, she, her, her face was not burned, um, but most of the rest of her body was. And she used to say that she, would, she, she couldn't give up in part because of her kids. Thankfully, I was one of them. Um, but she would also she also would face all these just seemingly unsurm- insurmountable problems and this incredible incredible chronic pain from the burns. Oh, I'm sure. Um, with a, a comment, she would always say, "You know, this too will this too shall pass." And so she was always getting to the next day in a way that was very admirable. Um, she ultimately succumbed to all this, uh, but she lived for forty years, almost forty years after the plane crash. But it was a it was a brutal thing to to kind of be around, um, and I'm I was so grateful for her. Even though you know, as a son, you you occasionally get put off by your mom, uh, but but she was a fantastic strength of will and character in her own right. And what's interesting to me is how much of your comments today have have really 
drawn in a similar way from the same strength, the power of, of your family, the power of your friends, the power of your, uh, of your kids, um, and how, how you drew strength from that. I, I didn't, you know, I kind of remember my mom saying that a lot, but for me in this conversation, your language yeah. ties directly back to the things that my mom would say in a way that I, I probably intellectually understood it, but I couldn't really emotionally understand it the way I do today. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm also fortunate because I have kids, you know, through Heather and, uh, and so I have a different sense of it, but your, your remarks really resonate for that regard in that regard. And I think that um, for the people who are watching this or who are listening to it, it's really far more powerful, I think, than uh, is given credit. It's yeah. a, it's a really, really powerful source of resolve and energy. And I, I think you draw on that uh, very elegantly. So they're making a movie uh, out of your book. Mm-hmm. When's that going to come out? Well, it was supposed to start filming of May of 2020. So it's been on hold, <laughs> um, but it's still, it, we're still, well, not me. I sold the rights to my book. So they're still in production, pre-production for the moment, but it's, it's coming. You could be one of the authors who actually stars in your own film. I, you know, I, it's funny. I, I, I can do a lot in front of the camera, <laughs> but I'm not an actress. I could be, but I'm not. <laughs> I, I don't like to limit myself. I don't like to put myself in a lane anymore. I was in a lane for 41 years. It's, you know, I, and ironically, when I started social media, somebody that was helping me get on social media and start that journey said, you have to really pick one thing. Don't be on the board of a couple things. Don't you know, you're either a breast cancer survivor or you're a motivational speaker, or you're an author, or you're this or that. And I was like, no, I'd rather not be on social media. I'm not doing this for social media. I'm doing this because this is who I am. And you're not going to put me in kind of a box. And I think in, in this world, we're so often labeled and put in a box. And that's why they call me the cancer disruptor. That's, it's a title I love because I, I speak how I feel and I tell the truth and I'm very vulnerable about it. And not a lot of people do that as much as they should, or we would want them to. It takes a lot of strength, actually, to, to do that. Um, a lot of courage. Indeed, indeed. And how did you decide that you wanted to put yourself in that place? And you, you must have taken some arrows as well as, you know, some plots. Oh, right? oh, lots. <laughs> But that was okay for me because I, and I thought about that before I published my book and before I went on this journey that I've gone on, I've lost friendships. I've lost my, a lot of important relationships, not a lot, but significant ones. And, and it was okay because I knew that the amount of people that I would save or help um, was more important than that, because the reason that I was that lost these people was because of pride and ego. And my pride and ego went out the door many years ago. I don't really care what people think of me, which I think, which is what I think people attracts people to me oftentimes, because I don't want people in my life that want something from me. There's no transaction in my life. I lived that life for a long time. And so if somebody asked me to do something for them, I do it out of the grace of, my heart. I don't want anything from that. And so I think that our world, especially with social media goes absolutely against that. So I think I'm in a kind of a disruptor in many ways, not just a cancer disruptor. Um, but I think it's really important that I, that I use my voice now because I didn't use it for a long time. There was a book review I was listening to a couple of days ago Um, it's on the New York times bestseller list and it's written about stoics. And one of the comments in it is kind of stuck with me is we love ourselves more than others, more than anyone else, but we, uh, I think, how do they say it? We value others' opinions more than we value our own. Yeah. I I mean, that makes sense. I didn't love myself more than other people for a long time. I do value myself and I love myself now more than other people, but I think. And and that's exactly what's coming across. I I mean, that's what I'm, that's what. Yeah. And I, and I don't value, 
I don't really value other people's opinion that much anymore. I, I'd like to think that I try, but my opinion matters to me. Yeah. And I think you have to be, so uh, earlier, the thing that came to mind was you're a Renaissance woman, right? Uh, but I think you, you've kind of described a, a version of wholeness in terms of who you are, um, that I, I think most people wouldn't be aware of. And it really, the thing that's interesting to me is one has to be an active listener with you. You don't have a choice. And it's not big. I mean, part is your story is compelling, but also you're saying important stuff. That's a great compliment. And, and then people need to, people need to listen to that, but but also you got to really pay attention because the stuff that's important, you don't need to say it twice. Yeah. Uh, but you're saying really important stuff, and I hope people really understand how important it is. I, I think there's a lot to come out of this in a very powerful way, um, and I'm grateful to you for that. Let me ask you one concluding question: Why Miami? Um, I needed a different landscape. And so in order to stop the tapes that were playing in my head for the first 41, two years of my life, I needed to change what I was looking at. And so I lived in Dallas and I loved it. And I love the people and I have incredible memories there, but you know, I'd look it down, I drive down the street and that's where I did chemo. And I drive down the street and that's where I had the arm debacle. I, you know, and so there was a lot of memories that I needed to kind of step back from. And so I needed to change the tapes in my head and I needed to change the landscape. And I was lucky enough to do it. I mean, I, I get to look at the ocean every day and, and I get to be that self-proclaimed athlete because I ride my bike and I walk to the grocery store. I don't have to get in my car and do that. And my lifestyle is better for me because I do have a fused arm and I am in chronic pain. And so for me, walking to the grocery store is much better than driving to the grocery store physically from a physical standpoint. And so I was able to change that. And I'm very, very grateful. I've kind of rebuilt my life here, which takes a lot of courage too. It's not easy, um, but I think I've done a good job and I'm, I'm happy here. I'm really happy here. It's a very peaceful place. It is, well, it is. It's, it's a fantastic place. And uh, I'm glad to hear that you're, you're happy. I, you have such a sense of resolve and, and quiet about you. Um, and like I said, it's, you're saying really important things. And I'm so grateful to you for doing that. Not for being on this podcast. This is a silly thing to do, but uh, it's important, maybe you know, helpful, but really for, for our nation and for the community at large, I'm really, really grateful for what you're doing and you're making a big impact. And I, uh, I think a lot of folks out there should be very grateful. So thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really, really thankful. Uh, wonderful job. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching this week's episode of Civil Discourse. To learn more about today's topic or our guest, visit www.the60percentsolution.com or www.tfip.group.